Hi everybody, this is uh, Mark Weitzman. Welcome to my uh, YouTube channel, Mark Theoretical Physics with Mark Weitzman. And I just want to do a little um, blog recording on like what I did the last week in physics. And um, so, oops, sorry. So the thing about doing physics, especially when you're like a lifetime physics student like I am, is there's so much to do and you have your priorities, but sometimes you just get tired and you want to do something easy or something else. So for me, you know, my priorities are always, you know, QFT, quantum field theory. Uh, I've got a zillion books where I have to read. I've read a lot of them. I've got to reread a lot of them. I've got to make latex notes on a lot of them. And I also have to make videos on many of them. So that's always my priority. And, you know, along with that, my secondary priority, this like sort of part of QFT is, you know, particle physics. You know, where you got, you know, your standard model. Guts. Supersymmetry, you've got um, maybe even string theory one day, not that interested in that. Then of course you have, you know, your extensions to like, you know, cosmology and maybe some tidying up to do with general relativity, astrophysics. I have a nice little book by Weinberg. It's really hard to read. Um, and then you have um, then you have sort of like the secondary stuff, which I try and do when I'm like tired of doing the hard stuff, but you got a lot of like statistical mechanics. You know, condensed matter. And, um, you know, there's always things on them. Um, there's always things on, you know, mathematical physics. Also, you know, quantum. You know, like the last, the quantum computation book that I read, Nielsen and Chang, that's like over, you know, 23, 24 years old, you know. So I'm not that familiar with all the new developments, very little. And, you know, mathematical physics, you have all these things on gauge, gauge fields, and knots, and things like that. Again, these are all secondary things to me. So, um, anyway, I decided this week to take a break from the QFT. I left out the, of course, the group theory is part of this. And, um, so I decided to do some more enjoyable or easier stuff for a few days. And I'll, um, I'll give you an idea of, um, exactly what I wasted my week on. So this is wonderful book, Theoret Sleeping Beauties in Theoretical Physics, which I talked about last week. And I've read like, there are about 26 chapters in here, and I think I've read about half of them. And some of them I decided to, I, I skipped verifying some equations in some of them. So I went back to the beginning. And um, let me just get a sample on here. I'm clicking on the wrong thing. Sorry about that. So, um, you know, if you look at the table of contents, the book starts out, the first real chapter is this orbits of planets are circles. And I, I went through this whole chapter and I verified every equation. So it's really like a nice introduction to the um, inverse square law and everything. And um, 
And then in the next chapter, the importance of being inverse square, they, they cover the quantum aspects of it with scattering and everything, why inverse square is so unique. But the, um, the orbits of planet circles are interesting, and, in, and they cover very thoroughly what's called the hodograph. This is a page from the book. And uh, Newton didn't know this. This was first discovered, I don't know who was the first one. Maxwell certainly did it. Hamilton, I think, did it as well. But it was in the 19th century that people realized that in velocity space, the uh, orbit is a circle. Even though it's an ellipse in position space, if you actually graph the velocity vector, it turns out to be a circle. And you can read this. You won't be able to understand all of it without reading the chapter in the book. Maybe you could read many of it. But this is a great diagram, and there's a lot of interesting things. And they even teach, at the end of this chapter, they teach the relativistic um, extension, uh, you know, special relativistic extension, not general relativistic, but special relativistic extension to orbits in a Coulomb potential. So that was nice. So in addition to this, um, watching all these videos on the MIT, I've now watched the first four videos, and um, they're okay. He's not the greatest lecturer, and they sort of cover Peskin and Schroeder, but I think the problem with these lectures is he doesn't do any of the details in class. He basically expects you to do all the details on the problem sets and in the recitations. And that's fine, but, you know, you sort of like, maybe you should watch the lectures after you do the problem sets and after you read the recitations and after you read the Peskin and Schroeder book because then, you know, you'll get more out of the lecture, I think. But, um... Anyway, I'm just reading these just to see how good they are or exactly how they teach it at MIT. Um, in addition to that, I've been going through these undergraduate lectures. I think this was from um, the Santa Barbara Institute. And um, these are okay, but they, they go very slowly. And the main irritating thing I found about these, first of all, the first four lectures were on Zooms. So those are good because you had clear presentations and you could look at the equations and verify them very easily on the backboard. The fifth lecture, they're back in class, and don't be turned off by it, but the first one on the fixed, fixed, fifth lecture, they didn't have the camera set up right, and you can barely read the equations on the blackboard and everything. Once you get past the fifth lecture, I've, I've gone two more lectures, you can easily read the blackboard and everything. Obviously, they're undergraduate lectures, but they're really focused on, like, condensed matter and non-relativistic physics, which is okay if you want to learn that stuff, and that stuff is important to learn, but it's not, you know, it's not like true quantum field theory. They, they, I mean, it is quantum field theory, but it's, it's just not, it's like non-relativistic quantum field theory. At the end of these lectures, they finally get to, like, Feynman diagrams and some various things, Klein-Gordon and everything, but it takes a long while to get there. Um, my main complaint about these lectures is, is the student questions because a lot of these lectures, they have like 10-minute periods in the middle of an hour and a half lecture, several of them, where the students are just asking question after question after question. They're not even good questions. If they were good questions, I wouldn't mind so much, but for the most part, they're not very good questions. And... Um, I think a lot of these um, students just want to hear themselves talk or whatever. But anyway, I'm going through these. Like I said, I've gone through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven now. And um, I'll keep on going. They're not very rigorous. A lot of things is just like onsets and things like that. So, But it's still, it's okay. But when I was going through this, it sort of reunited this my interest. I had bought this book on the Oxford Solid State Phys Physics book. I had bought this book. Here it is on Amazon as well. And um, it's a pretty good book. And there's a whole lecture series. You can just watch the lecture series if you want. I, I watched all of these lectures. It's about 22 of them. And it doesn't cover, like I said, it's only a sub field of condensed matter, but it's good. It's easy. You learn a little bit about things you didn't know. So I watched all of them, but now I feel like I have to actually do the problems and verify all the equations and everything, and so I'm doing that. Um, it's, it's kind of relatively easy stuff for me, so I don't mind. 
And as part of that, I also have another book, which I read like halfway through, but I never finished, on um, condensed matter field theory. This is the third edition. I Actually, I think I have the first edition. But this is an excellent book. It's like the field theory aspect of it is pretty easy, and you learn a lot about condensed matter because it's all field theory as applied to condensed matter. And these are the uh, chapters, and it's got like a nice chapter on renormalization theory and broken symmetry and topological field theory. They added stuff. I don't have this in my book on gauge theories and other stuff. So that's sort of what I've been doing this week. Um, as I said, you know, when I was at Caltech, I... Um, you know the biggest the biggest biggest mistake i i made two huge mistakes at caltech you know sorry um two huge mistakes when at uh caltech 40 years ago in the uh theoretical phys in a PhD theoretical physics program. And they tell you that when you're there, they say there's only two things you have to do in your first year. They say pass, they call them a Caltech candidates exams or other places they call them qualify. And the, uh, so that was one, and two was get an advisor. For various reasons, um, I did neither of these things. I did pass the, um, I did pass, take some candidates' exams in my second year at Caltech, but by then I was already uh, on my way out. You know, I wasn't forced out or anything, but I already decided that um, this wasn't going to work for me to my, to my regret now. But when you have an advisor, you you know, the great thing about having an advisor, a PhD advisor, is that, you know, he, he tells you what to do, what not to do, and, he, and it's not so much that. You can sort of, I figured that out myself, but it forces you to do it because you got to meet with your advisor and you got to, like, give your progress and this and that, you know. So when you have somebody to supervise yourself, it's really, you're much more likely to get things done. When you're on your own, like I've been, especially for the last 40 years, you start and you stop. You know, I can't tell you how many quantum field theory books I would go like halfway through and then it would be like, this is getting a little bit hairy and too hard and I would stop. Then five years later, you don't remember any of it. You got to start, you got to start again. Um, so I've had on my site, I'll go to my site right now. Um. Hold on one second. I'll get there. Sorry about this. Um, so on my QFT site last week, somebody posted a question about Coleman's book in chapter 16 and he's doing all this stuff and everything and and I just wrote look I, I went through this like a year and a half ago and it was all all right for me but I don't remember any of it now I mean when you take quantum field theory I think unless you're a practicing physicist a lot of the details you'll forget you'll remember the Feynman diagrams and how to calculate the Feynman diagrams and how to get how to get them from the Lagrangian and you'll remember various things about renormalization, but you're not going to remember every detail about the Green's theorems and every model and everything. And this gentleman just kept on going. He wanted answers and everything. I think he had some real misconceptions. I tried, you know, but I really couldn't help him because I, I and I said, I'm going to go back and do some latex notes. You know, right now, just as an example, let me see if I can get this up. Uh, just give me a second here. 
Okay, so these are my latex notes on Sidney Coleman. And as you can see, even though I went through about chapter 35 on my notes, I'm only through chapter... Uh, Oh, I didn't even, I left out some sections from chapter 6, and I did some things in chapter 7. And, uh, I guess I did some things in chapter 8, and that's as far as I went. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I didn't even finish chapter 8. So, you know, it takes a Making up these notes takes a long time, and uh, at least for me. So um, it's one of my things. That I told the student I'm going to go back next year and go through these notes, and I'll, I'll probably make a video on that problem that he asked that. Coleman has some really detailed problems, and this was like one hard problem on one of the problem sets. We went for pages of calculations. So there's no way I'm going to remember that stuff. Anyway, that's sort of one of the problems, especially as you get older. You forget things. You, you remember, I remember all the basics, and there are things, I'm, and the easier stuff is, the less likely. I'm never forget going to forget anything from first year of physics or calculus or anything like that. But even from quantum mechanics, when I don't do it for a long time, I might forget something here and there. So um, anyway, um, just... Uh, update you on what I've been doing and probably this week I'll go back to the group theory and the quantum field theory and hopefully start posting some videos. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.